Welcome everybody to the Faking, Faking Notes, Notes Podcast. Podcast, 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 podcast. We're back, y'all. So uh, season three has been a wild ride. Um, and we are happy to finish this season off with a banger. Uh, with a discussion of like one of the most important books I've ever read, How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie. We're going to go through some spark notes. So, please, like and subscribe. Give us those five-star reviews. If you leave a review, we will read this on the podcast. Mm-hmm. So, like, we come ran on out. out. We're, we're out. We've read all our reviews. Um, so just keep keep them coming. Also, if you want to talk to us in between the episodes, join the Discord. We're always hanging out on the Discord. We're having a good time. Uh, great conversations. We've got a great little community going on over there. And now let's get into it. So this episode is, I think, going to be one of the most important that we dropped this season uh, because it's the last one. Also, <laughs> <laughs> I think, you know, there's a saying that goes, if you want to go fast, go by yourself. If you want to go far, go together. And the only way to go together is to learn how to work with people, how to win friends, influence people. And uh, that's kind of going to be what we're talking about today. We're going to go through some highlights of one of the most influential books in my life that I've read uh, called How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie. Um, and we're going through some of the principles here. Sweet. And we, we're putting our own little spin. So we're going to uh, how to kiss butt and influence people. Yeah. You know, it's the Faking Nuts podcast. Here we have yeah. to spice, spice it up. Mm, delicious. <laughs> what, a, what a sound effect. What is I'm, I'm here for it. Is that what you were searching before before we press record? That's, that's no, big... man. I, I had that I had that ready to go. You know, this is, this is dial this is dialed in. So <laughs> briefly, this book it's often cited as one of the most influential books for business for leaders. Um, a lot of the famous books that we've referenced since then all kind of point back to this. And here's the thing. So a couple quick bullet points before we go in here. Uh, Carnegie, you know, Carnegie Hall, not the same guy. It no. Is, <laughs> it, no, this it, is it, Dale. It, it, this, this is Dale, Dale Carnegie, uh, not Andrew Carnegie. So mm-hmm. just to throw that out there, um, although I'm sure Andrew Carnegie used a lot of these uh, principles. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, sure. Dale Carnegie, one of the first to really like write about these things with how to win friends and influence people. Um, before we even like go through point by point, I think it's important that um, – and Drew, you've said this really well in the past, like in our uh, money, influence, marketing, some of our previous social skill episodes, which you also go check out, is that having these guidelines and templates and books and reading about power or influence or making friends can f- feel odd and scuzzy. It's just like, oh, is this some big game? Uh, having more influence and having more friends and having more people like you it's a great thing to have <laughs> mm-hmm. and to really execute on all of these various tips and tricks, the social skills, everything you have to be sincere about it. Everyone can see if, if you're not following through with these with like good intentions, we all know it's obvious. Uh, this is just simply tools and templates and understanding on how to be more likable, to, to kiss ass more effectively, mm-hmm. to be a better leader, to be a better uh, follower, employee, mm-hmm. it's just helpful to know. And just like if you're out there playing your instrument, it'd be like, no, I don't want to learn anything about theory or history or how to practice effectively. That's cheating. I just mm-hmm. need to like go make notes. Like, no, you would want to put time in how to effectively practice, how to effectively perform your technique. All those things go towards making you a better musician. Uh, why would making friends or interacting in the business place, why would that be any different? These are just techniques, practice techniques, theories, f- frameworks to kind of help jumpstart uh, your way into influence. Before we hop into it, I also wanted to echo what Trevor said. You must be genuine and you must be sincere. A lot of the, the book does say a lot of that, like flattery, the difference between a compliment and a flatter and flattery is very simple. It's like a compliment you feel. And flattery is to butter somebody up to get something in return, 
right? Mm. And so I, I view these mental models and frameworks more as the act of brushing your teeth. You know, it, it's like it's something that you do to make sure you're not doing anything wrong. Because have you ever had a social interaction where you're like, well, that went badly? And you have no idea why. Yeah. Well, this book can maybe reveal <laughs> some things you might have done wrong that like could have put a person off. And there's something to know when you have a little checklist like this, when interactions do inevitably go badly, but you do everything you can to be empathic, see things from the other person's perspective, it allows you to kind of absolve yourself and realize, look, that person's crazy. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Like, I, they don't want to like me. And that's okay. So as long as you do your homework, you do the best you can do. You can also have a lot of social anxiety dissipate in knowing that you did your best and did everything you could. And if things don't work out, and they won't always work out, you can more easily let go. So without mm. further ado, let's just hop in. Um, this is going to be in four different sections. We're going to cover techniques in handling people, six ways to make people like you, Win people to your way of thinking, which is so important, and be a leader. How to change people without giving offense or arousing resentment. And so, uh, we got this this uh, blow to blow summary from uh, Farnham Street Media Inc. Oh so my god! I didn't even look at the link. Farnham Street. Yeah, uh, he's done great interviews. He's the one who who emphasizes uh, direction, not speed. I didn't even like look at the URL. So anyway, oh, yeah. <laughs> cool. no, like shout out. Cause like, you know, summarizing books is very hard, but uh, I've read this book maybe three or four times. And like, after looking at these uh, bullet points it covers a lot of it. So let's get start started with uh, techniques and handling people. Um, the first one, number one, Trevor, uh, don't criticize, condemn or complain. Whoa. Whoa. I've been guilty of that. Have you? No, never. I've never complained in my life. <laughs> Just, like, oh my god. Okay, so this is another one of those like stoic principles that they'll mention. Uh, I I can't remember if it's Marcus Aurelius or Seneca or one of them. But one of the old dead Greek people uh, said something like, "Don't be caught complaining, not even to yourself." And I've been thinking about that more and more because. I think it's just important to like emphasize and like really hone in on the like complaint part. It's not like don't raise issues. Like if there's a problem, you want to bring that up with your boss. You want to be in a in a position to where you can. You want to let people know if things are rough. But I think like the complaints and like the criticize, it's it's like like negativity. It's having these things without a goal. And I don't know if that's like a correctly ass assessing assessing these types of things. Um, but if it's just to like bring on the negative, you don't always need a solution. Sometimes you just got to be able to like voice, hey, I think this is an issue. It's just like what happens when someone complains to you? Like what's your first instinct? Stop. Yeah. <laughs> shut Please up. just shut up. <laughs> yeah. yeah just, I'm going to kill you. <laughs> it's, it's, it's more of just like, hey. You know, when you're when you're in a leadership position and people, everybody complains to you, right? But when you are a leader and you have people that work with you that come with, I know you said don't come with a solution, but or you don't have to, but you don't have to. But like yeah. even just the act of saying like this is a problem and I'm testing some solutions will update you, makes the other your counterpart feel so much better. If you don't just like blankly there's no more there's no more mangoes in the freezer Ugh, i'm hungry it's like uh cool go buy mangoes yeah like or just like <laughs> tell me okay so in a different so this is a stupid example but another way you could say that is like hey notice there are no mangoes in the freezer i don't have any money right now but here's a link boss could you like buy this could you put this on the next Amazon fresh like order and here's a link boom like you didn't solve it but you came up with a plan of action you were like I'm working on it like it's much better than just saying everything's on fire I don't know where the fire extinguisher is and I'm thirsty it's like yo 
chill. <laughs> yeah. Well, and another thing too, just even with um, like in just like in a like a workplace setting, it's just like, hey, we're delayed on this because you know, and it's not like you put us in a bad place or something. It's 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 how it's framed. We're delayed on this. The time's literally tight. We know you're under pressure to or whatever it whatever else it is. It's just like you're pairing criticism or complaints with something else that's like positive. You're you're taking something negative. And I think this kind of flows throughout all this. And I try to think about this all the time. You should never avoid the negative stuff. I think that gets you into more trouble, Mm -hmm. but you should always try to find ways uh, to handle negative things with like grace, benefit of the doubt. Um, I try to assume ignorance, not malice. Assume someone's busy. They're not intentionally not replying to your text more likely than not. They're just busy or stressed about something else. Assume they're kind of like stuck in their own world. But if it's okay, like, hey, this wasn't ideal. I think I know why, but this wasn't ideal. Could we next time get a bigger heads up or something like this? And then next time, can we get a bigger heads up? Because, you know, and then it it like gives permission it just makes it clear like why something might not be unacceptable or why the complaint is is warranted Mm -hmm. because a big part of any team and i literally just saw this on instagram before this like they shared like google's team building chart you know the number one priority was like i think what they called like psychological safety like that was the f- uh, of their of a business team's Maslow hierarchy. It wasn't anything else. Like, like number one, psychological safety, which is that like people feel safe, um, being vulnerable, being able to v- voice complaints. Because the moment someone doesn't tell me that they don't think this deadline works, or that they don't tell me that hey, I'm not available, then we're all in trouble. Mm-hmm. And same thing. We're going through a big, uh, like a huge project at work. I go up to all of the big wigs. It's just me in the room with the big wigs. And I'm like, the deadline doesn't work. Here's why. Mm-hmm. You know, let's learn from past experiences where it didn't quite work out. Or in the past, we've underestimated so and so. Or this is going to be expensive. Or would it be better if we did this? So, it is a complaint. It's a like a critique of the situation, but it's voiced in that kind of mutual sense of like, I'm bringing this up to spur change, not just to bring you down. Yeah, that's huge. And also just really quickly, we'll cover the other aspects of handling people before we go in, in, in depth on each of them. The other two techniques in handling people is to give honest and sincere appreciation. And number three, arouse in the other person an eager want. So let's talk about just really quickly giving honest and sincere appreciation. I think this is very much overlooked. And I think a lot of the root of these principles you'll see, they have to be rooted in gratitude. If you come from a position of gratitude in your life, a lot of the stuff falls in place automatically. Back to number one, don't criticize, condemn, or complain. If you have gratitude for what you do have and what is going around in your life, and you really take a moment to, as David Goggins says, reach into the cookie jar to your past achievements, things that are going right, Mm. you'll find that there's not too much to complain about. There's not too much to criticize. And then you can actually walk back some very harsh things you want to say because you see the other person or the other people do most of what they do very, very well and very right. And then, you know, if you are grateful, then you're already in this area of where you can like know the things that are going well and you can give the honest and sincere appreciation that people often don't get in their lives. What is the value of like giving honest and sincere appreciation, Trevor? I think you you said it. <laughs> or or can, I, can I actually yeah. fr- flip it? Yeah. What does it feel like to receive it? Oh yeah, give me yeah, that baby. shit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But it feels good because there's just something that it disappears in adulthood. Like you just don't get, you know, the high fives anymore, and like no one seems to like recognize it. 
which is weird. I mean, you do see sometimes it's to an extreme where like people get surrounded by yes people and then you're constantly told your idea is great. Kanye. When they should. Yeah, yeah. Like, and, and that happens to more powerful people. That's a studied thing. The more powerful you get, the more people start kissing your ass. And then you never know when you're doing something wrong or when people you hired may not be the best people. That happens all the time. Beyond that, even in, you know, like this stages uh, of our life, it just, it feels good and it's free to offer this stuff. It doesn't cost you anything to give a compliment. And the moment you say like, hey, I really like this. And particularly when you go beyond just like, oh, I like this or yay or whatever. But like you give some bit of like actual like specific tailored compliment. I really like how you handled that email. Like, mm-hmm. I think it got the point across without being mean or something like that. Or like, hey, I think you it was a great thing that you did X. Uh, and because it just shows, it shows that you care. It feels good. I think the key thing is, of course, honesty. Like, don't give a compliment in that way if you didn't like it. You can almost always find something or something about it. Like, hey, for that piece or that book, you know, it's not like really like for me or whatever, but like, I'm glad you did it. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm glad you like went out there and like did it because I think this is going to help you out or something. Um, just don't forget the <laughs> sincere appreciation. Mm-hmm. It can go so far. It makes you feel good. Just know how it makes you feel when you receive it. And then if you're able to dole it out, like I said, that doesn't cost you anything. It costs you zero. And and one way that I've employed it in my life is like when you think positive things about people, which happens, Okay. I know we like to think that we only like have complaints. We only think negatively about other people. But oftentimes, if you're aware of your thoughts and you think something very positive about somebody, whether it's in a moment or it's even you're doing your dishes and you think about somebody that does that's positive in your life, text them. Mm. Tell them. You don't know how long they're going to be on the on the earth. You don't know how many opportunities you're going to get to tell them. So just tell them in the moment. They might be exactly what they needed to hear. Okay. Like whenever you think something positive about somebody, voice it if it's sincere. And usually when you think it, it is sincere. Your thoughts are pretty, pretty good compass. So, uh, okay. And, and then arouse in, 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 a, a, in the other person an eager want. And this is something for leaders out there. Um, if you have a clear vision of something, oftentimes other people will say, I don't see it. Because if they did see it, they would have done it, right? And if it was something people easily grasped, it's probably not thinking, you're probably not thinking big enough. But what you must do when you're working with a team is arouse in the other people an eager want, right? Like what it, what is your vision doing to help them achieve something that they really want in life, right? So uh, yeah, th- that that's kind of like, more abstract, but I think is really, really important. Let's move on to the six ways to make people like you. Okay. This is the kind of stuff my uh, 12 years, 12 year old self uh, would have hmm. known. Will you read through all school. of them? And then yeah, we'll I'll read through all one by one. Yeah. Okay. So number one, be genuinely interested in other people. Number two, smile. Number three, remember that a person's name is the sweetest most important sound in any language to them, their own name. Number four, be a good listener and encourage others to talk about themselves. Number five, talk in terms of the other person's interests. Number six, make the other person feel important and do it sincerely. Now, there's kind of a theme, right? And I want to just call attention to it before we dive into each one. It's not about you. We have this feeling in life, it's called the spotlight effect. And it's this idea that everybody is very much paying attention to everything about you <laughs> at all times. <laughs> but in actuality, everybody is way more concerned with how people perceive them. So when you employ a bunch of these six ways to make people like you, you know, being interested, smiling, remembering the person's name, being a good listener, talking to them in, about things that they like and making them feel important sincerely, like you're playing into their spotlight effect and you're contributing to that. 
And so if you want people to like you and a way to really get people to like you is to like them first and think about them and put them first. So let's, let's dive into each one uh, specifically. So be genuinely interested in other people. Trevor, how do? So I feel like all six of these bullet points, like we've talked about <laughs> yeah. it's in some way, shape or form and in depth in all these other uh, episodes about influence and social skills. I, I bet we did a lot of this in like the social skills one, because w- when we're going through this life, I've already mentioned, you're not getting many compliments. The act of living is difficult. You're tired, you're beat down. All you hear is negative news. And you're at, you're working some soulless job, or playing some soulless gigs, and like you're on the hamster wheel, and you catch yourself complaining, and you're getting in that negative mind space, and just like nothing feels nothing feels like it's going right. You envisioned your life, and even though you've probably achieved more than your past vision, you still don't feel like you're there. So just like we inherently like beat ourselves down. We want more. We have like higher expectations, particularly as artists. You know, we're sold all of these things. So we want to go out and achieve, achieve everything. And no one asks, really like asks you or really actually cares what you do. You can, particularly within your field, like the people we love to feel most validated by our musicians don't, don't care. They're already, they're like worried about theirs. Like, yes, if you talk to non-musicians, they'll go out and say, oh, like, you know, Why'd you play the cello? Isn't it like, isn't it big? You know, you got. How get, long have you been playing? How viola? long have you been playing? Why did you play this? And it's like that's great. I mean, it's fun to have people interested in, but like, it doesn't get too deep. The easiest way I've found in all of these conversations, and it's like tried and true, I've tested it, going to weddings, talking to people who work what on paper is the most boring jobs. And what on paper seems like the most boring person. It, I even made it like a game. It's like, okay, like this person seems like disinterested with life. They don't want to talk about their boring law job or their boring business job working in finance. And then I go to them and I'm genuinely interested in like what they do for a living and what their interests are beyond work. And so you give them an interview. You're asking follow-up questions. You're digging deeper and then something always happens. There's some light bulb. And then they just open up. A great example. I was at a wedding recently. Uh, I'll leave names redacted, but I was talking to the husband or fiance of um, someone else at this this wedding and like works standard law job, seemed just kind of like tired. On the surface, not the most interesting conversation is going to come out of this. But just after digging and probing, his younger sister went to school in Greensboro in theater. I thought you said youngest sister. Ha. Oh. (laughs) I was like, okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, that's great. But so she works in theater. And then so we're talking about that. And he was like, yeah, she's just, I like, I see her work so hard. Like, I don't know how anyone works in this. And then we're talking about like the, the, the grinds of the industry, but like how tenacity and all these other things we talk about this. Next thing you know, it's like, oh, where'd you propose? Oh, down in Hilton Head on the, I, like I see on your shirt, it was, you know, it's like Sherlock Holmes. I see like the little Hilton Head pin, the lighthouse. It's like, hey, I used to go there as a kid. Like what's like special about Hilton Head to you? And he's like, oh, I proposed on that lighthouse. Like growing up, it was like always like the happiest you know, those were always the highlights. And the next thing you know, I'm talking to surface level, what would be a normal, boring, how's the weather? Why are we here on this weekend? By conversation it was like 45 minutes talking about like all sorts of things, but it's leading through and by generally like being interested in what they do. And like, that's how you get to this deeper level of conversations. We can probably not speak for three years. But I feel like I could walk up to this person at whoever else's next wedding and they would have remembered that conversation. That was a meaningful conversation that stood out amongst a sea of other boring stuff. And I could see it in the face. That's what's crazy. Like literally like light up. Like it hadn't been that happy (laughs) in like a long time. I never saw it at any other point. But I remember the moment we started talking about Hill and Head. 
And then we're getting into the engagement and like what Hilton head means to this person. And then his sister, uh, it's, it's just wild. Like you, you remember those things and it starts by being interested in them. Easy way to do it. It's an interview. Yo, fake and fam, you hear, you witness the magic of these principles every episode we interview somebody. Like, if, I don't know if you've noticed, but oftentimes, you know, we'll have a guest who's often a stranger to either one or both of us. And at first, their answers are kind of like short and polite. But the moment we like ask them a curveball question or something that's deeper or something that's atypical, if you watch the video, you can see their face light up. Mm. Um, most recently was was the David Kim interview. He's been interviewed so many different times. But as soon as we got past like his story and, and things like it started asking about, you know, his outdoorsmanship and uh asking about his daughters and just things that like people you know, like if 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 you have the natural progression of a conversation, you go s- super broad. And then if you notice something interesting, that's like a cue. That's like a rabbit hole. Let's, let's let's go down here just a little bit. See if there's anything interesting. Oftentimes there is, and everybody appreciates that because you're showing you're genuinely interested. You're listening. Okay, be a good listener. You're listening and you're responding. Uh, this is something I learned with like improv comedy. Like when I was doing the uh, UCB, every word somebody says is important. And it's a possibility. So Mm. when you kind of look at conversations from that perspective, you can bring a playfulness to it as well. You'll be smiling, which is number two. Um, Yeah. And, you know, in terms of the the one thing that I want to, I want to cover, you know, remembering people's names can be very hard for people. I'm terrible at it. So it's a practice. Like I am too. The, one of the, the disadvantages I feel like I have is like I'm a African American man who plays the viola in Los Angeles. How many of those are there? <laughs> you know, uh, one of the things that uh, happens to me often is I'll play a gig and then I won't see that mm-hmm. person for like two or three years and then I'll see them again and they'll remember me immediately. Like, Drew, what's up, man? It's so good to see you. And I'm like, yeah, it's so great. Yeah, it's good to see you my again. guy. <laughs> yeah. Dude, sup? Person? Brother? Yeah. <laughs> uh, brother. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's, and it's, it's, it's not on a part of malice. Um, Oftentimes, you know, uh, people of Western European culture will say that all black people look the same or all Asian people look the same. And it's just because they just haven't taken the time to really, like, be around a lot of them and view a lot of them. But it also happens for us, too, when you play with just a ton of, like, people that kind of seem similar and stuff. This is why having deep conversations with people is key because when you have a deep conversation you ask somebody about themselves you are interested you can find different anchor points that you can associate with that person and their uniqueness therefore making their name a lot easier to remember too because then if you see them two years later like oh we talked about spectroscopy (laughs) newton (laughs) astrophysics yes okay Neil deGrasse you Tyson, it was so great to talk to you. Yeah, yeah. Neil deGrasse Tyson, it's so great to meet you again, bro. Like it's wild. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So all of these 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 ways uh, work together. Um, and because I'm like it, like Amy now like laughs because I'll remember every detail about that conversation, like the Hilton Head, like his sister going to Greensboro College in theater, and now she lives in Atlanta. And I would just forget that I won't know the name. <laughs> and she'll laugh. She'll be like, "Yeah, you talked to you know Tony for like forty minutes." I'm like, "Tony," and then she says, "Like you know, oh well, he's from Philly." And I'm like, "Oh yeah, Philly from who does this? He lives with his wife. His cousin does this. Like like all these details because like the details to me are important." But you emphasized the importance of the name to me years ago, and maybe from this book, like it's the sweetest and mo- most important sound in any language. 
we're not often called that. It's we've, we, we build an identity with these names. You know, what names your parents call you, what names your sweetheart calls you, your childhood friends versus your work friends. Like the name is important. Um, we've talked about another episode, so I won't go necessarily into the strategies, but particularly when you're working with young kids, you're teaching their name is kind of all they have. They don't own anything yet. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and they're treated like little pieces of property anyways. And they're just shuttled around and told what to do. The, their name is one of the few things they really have a stake a claim in. So if you're interacting with really young kids, you're teaching in a classroom, you're, you're doing some workshop, that's when I really, I'm sitting down and like, okay, this is a very key point. I must remember their names. The quick strategy is instead of reading a roster or going down the list of names, have them tell you their name because then you can kind of associate the voice. You hear how they say it. You're like attaching it. I'm just like, I would always introduce myself. I'd go down the room and everyone kind of like get a chuckle at it because I'd say my name 18 times. It'd be like, hi, my name is Trevor. What is your name? They'd tell me their name. Hi, my name is Trevor. What is your name? Nice to meet you. I don't know, blah, blah, blah. And it's silly, but like, there's just something about that personal connection. And then I would never, never forget their name ever again, just because they they told me I wasn't reading it off a list. It was out of their words. The last thing, um, (laughs) not the best example, but you see this in big name leaders who are known for charisma. And they would always say this about Bill Clinton. Everyone who ever would like speak to him are like, oh, I interacted with him. They're like, he made you feel like you were the only person in the room. He remembered your name. John Mulaney has a hilarious skit about this too. And like Bill Clinton remembering his mom's name. It's a great bit. I won't ruin it. But here is, you know, at the time, one of the most powerful people on the planet. It's a president. He remembers everyone's name. And then you just feel connected. People like that, particularly when you're in the upper position. When yes. you are the higher plane, yes. if you're going down there, it's just like higher status. When someone reaches out, like, "Hey, it's the other," I get emails like this all the time. Hey, I don't know if you remember me from back and blah blah blah. And it's like, yes, I do. And here's a fun fact: what I remember about that interaction, Drew. You open up a lot of these podcasts. We have guests on. Like, hey, don't you remember that time? Like three, four years ago, we were in this. You know. Stephanie Matthews, it was great because we were all cutting up at this first rehearsal and they told us this funny thing. And they'd be like, yeah, I do remember that. Like, It's just showing that you were interested, that you care, uh, and it makes them feel amazing. (laughs) Makes them feel important that you remember things about them. And so I I do think we would be remiss if we didn't give a couple of things, like a couple of tips on how to remember names, just really quickly. First of all, until you know that person's name, never say, so what do you think about this without say, say their name back to them as mm. often as possible during the first conversation. Smart. Then when you leave, what I do, I do a little game. So if I go to a party, I've been going to a lot of work parties with Michelle recently. And so it's all just a bunch of doctors that I will never, ever meet except when I go to parties. They always remember my name. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes I don't remember their names. When you look around the room when no, you're not talking to anybody, just quiz yourself. What's their name? What's their name? And recite it three times while looking mm. in their face. Every time you look at somebody new, Paul, 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 Steve, 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 Stacy, 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 right? Just doing that over the course of a night, it really helps a ton mm. in helping like retain people's names. But, uh, yeah, recite their name back to them as you're in conversation. It feels weird and awkward, but they don't mind. They like the sound of their name. Remember that. It's the sweetest sound to a person in any language is their name. Mm. Okay, let's move on, shall we? Uh, how to win people over to your way of thinking. Persuasion. This is incredibly important, especially if you're trying to get a team on the same page as you and get them to pursue the same goal. Okay, so there are 12 points here. I'll go through them really quickly. Number one, the only way to get the best of an argument is to avoid it. Star and asterisk that one. Number Mm. two, show respect for the other person's opinions. Never say, quote, you're wrong, unquote. 
If you are wrong, number three, if you are wrong, admit it quickly and emphatically. Number four, begin in a friendly way, no matter what, like whatever social interaction you do, begin it very friendly. Number five, get the other person saying yes twice and as quickly as possible. Number six, let the other person do a great deal of the talking. I can attest that's very powerful. Number seven, let the other person feel that the idea is his or hers. So plant the seed and let them think that they thought of it all along. Inception. Inception. Number eight, try honestly to see things from the other person's point of view. This is key. Number nine, be sympathetic with the other person's ideas and desires. Number 10, appeal to the nobler motives. Number 11, dramatize your ideas. And number 12, throw down a challenge. So Mm. were there any of those that kind of stuck out to you, Trevor? I mean, a lot of these are great, obviously. Like a lot of these are like things and phrases that we'll enact. And some I always have to like actively remind myself. And I think everyone who's listening will kind of get a sense of that too. Like you, you'll have heard like, wow, oh, I do always do that. And then for a couple of them, will be like, oh, I never do that. Or, oh, I do the opposite. You, oh, know, you know what's one that yeah. nobody does? It's Let's number hear three. It. If you are wrong, admit it quickly and emphatically. Like, can I give an, can I give an example yeah. of when I did that? So when um, our violinist of our string quartet uh, – said that they wanted to play with a different quartet. Um, and they kind of listed, in my opinion, I'm not going to blast them, but in mm-hmm. my opinion, it was a bogus argument. Um, I said immediately, you're right. Uh, I should have explained that. I was wrong for that. And I truly mean it. In that moment, like that took all the air out of whatever could have been a disagreement over something trivial Mm -hmm. just by admitting it it really puts you on a on a ground where you are fallible and that's okay we're all fallible honestly it's it's it makes you more trustworthy because if people everybody tries to be infallible they all think that they never make mistakes they want you to think they never make mistakes and when you do that you make yourself seem less trustworthy Mm-hmm. implicitly and subconsciously. So when you do admit your faults, it actually allows people to trust you a little bit more because you are the type of person that will admit when you're wrong. So when you're right, they can definitely believe that you that I you're right. I definitely try to like enact this. Uh, so I think one of the key words about <laughs> like admitting this is the quickly part because – I try to be conscious about it and I agree. You, you don't even like hop into some conversation and then like have 15 minutes of settle time to like get to the get to the problem. I think preemptively being like, oh, I was wrong. Even if someone else like made the mistake. A big part of leadership is taking the sword. Like if you're getting paid more or you're the manager, like you should have told them something else like you should have re-emphasized it like looking for opportunities for things that you can do within your control it's like i should have sent a reminder email did you always have to no but you still should have it could have helped prevent it like that's true that's true like you should have i should have sent that reminder email or whatever or oh yes i said this deadline i shouldn't have said this um but i think to the quickly part of it one just get to it because then it's out of there it's not hovering over it but also don't set on it too long. Like you don't want to sit in the negative. You need to acknowledge it, but quickly move on. I I see this a lot too, where it's just like, I was wrong. And then like four paragraphs, like explaining the situation or, and even if it's the most valid, most true thing, it will just always sound like what? Number one, a complaint. Uh, You know, it's like, ah, like, well, we can't do the, like this because of this, this, this. And also like, then they, you start getting either the life story. I'm just like, we, we don't really care because we're self-centered. We want to be relatable and, and approachable, but like we get it. Like don't belabor and like live in the negative space. 
you have to go there in order to be trustworthy and just to like move on. You just have to acknowledge, yes, I was wrong, but I don't think it's as effective to then make the wrongness about you and then start giving, oh, I worked really like hard on this, whatever. Like that's not helping the situation. Acknowledge it and then spin it back towards how it actually affects them and or how you can reach some solution or how you get to something better next time. So that's just a key point about that. Trevor, you're wrong. <laughs> and here's why. <laughs> no, but I, I say that in jest because, yeah, when another one of these things I want to highlight is like, you know, never telling people you're wrong. Think about it the other way. So another one of the things is like, number eight says, try to honestly see things from the other person's point of view. Okay. So if you tell somebody's somebody they're wrong, and then you try to see it from their point of view, first of all, being told you're wrong hurts. It's like, wait, what? No. And then you already start getting into an argument, which then is not, is arguments are seldom productive unless mm -hmm. they are like structured debates with like real statistics. Yeah. You know, there are but, rules to debates. Like there they're like, there's, debates. it's a structured thing. Exactly. Yeah. And there's a moderator in a debate, right? Mm. But when you're just, you're drinking beers and you're at a party and you're like, no, you're wrong, bro. It's like, okay, you just killed the momentum of the conversation, right? Um, it, it's kind of an improv. Mm. It's always yes and. So when you say no, that destroys the reality. Because what you're doing is whenever you're conversing with people, you're building a shared reality and understanding, right? When you say no, that's like you literally putting a wall in between the two of you. So uh, the reason why I'm saying this is because people, especially if you go on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> big mistake. Big mistake, right? They don't, they've never read this book. People on Twitter have never read this book. And they, it tells because they all they do is argue. You never win anything in an argument. You actually lose. Even if you win an argument, you lose. Mm -hmm. I don't you know, know. I don't know if you ever heard that. What's up, yeah. Dan? No, I was going I was just going to say like, you know who also hasn't read this book? A good healthy amount of politicians in our government. I wanted to speak specifically speak to it. that. Speak so because we have this weird problem and it's a collective issue. It's on yeah. all of us. So it's we want to always sides. blame yeah. the not even no not even like a whole both siderism thing, but like literally uh -huh. like it's like on the American people, <laughs> uh, yeah. not just like the politics. Because what you don't see is admitting you're wrong. You yes. never see it. Nope. And there's a reason why. It's not just because a lot of them are like conceited, terrible assholes. It's because when people have admitted they're wrong in recent past, they've been punished. And we stopped having a pathway towards redemption, which is weird because that's what we love. You know, you get all these Christian values. Everybody things. loves a, a, they, they love the redemption story. Comeback, a comeback. Yeah. Everyone loves a comeback. Yeah. We're waiting for the comeback, but we've stopped allowing the comeback. It gets you into the cancel culture thing. It's weird where like you, you know, you mess up a while back. Like we don't have re paths to redemption. And now we've seen very recent examples. The past president who like never admits wrongdoing ever and is not punished for it. Mm -hmm. admitting you're wrong is now the like capital sin it's admitting you lost society. the election yeah mm -hmm. and this is where we get into trouble so i was listening to i can't remember which podcast but one of these people who like it's, it's talking about power similar things like this and they were talking about how we're in we're in real deep trouble not like necessarily like whole civil war things but just looking at other countries Russia in the 90s, all these other tough situations where there have been Civil War-esque issues, uprisings. And they said the biggest key indicator is that the other sides weren't willing to forgive. They weren't willing to admit fault. It's like th this other group of people did this to me, and it could it very well be true. It could be heinous and unforgivable, 
but there's just this back and forth. Well, you did this, but then you did this, you did this. And the in- inability to just like at some point say like, hey, let's acknowledge this. This is all terrible. We need to find some path forward. They Dang, couldn't you sound come. Like Boruto. Yeah. <laughs> you sound like uh, anime. I, I haven't even I mean, I haven't, I haven't seen the uh, uh, okay. seen that reference. No, but it's it's true. I can't remember uh who was even saying this, but like that was the difference. If if you couldn't get like both sides to just like find a way to forgive and move past, even knowing that you've been wronged, that's when you get Iran in the seventies. That's you get that's when you get America in eighteen sixty one. Yeah. So what I think is like huge about this is there's a lack of being sympathetic to another person's ideas and desires. There is a lack of letting the other person do in a great deal of talking. It's a great lack of listening and also appealing to nobler motives. This is number 10, right? You said it earlier is like giving benefits of the doubt and like maybe uh seeing negligence or instead of malice mm-hmm. right or maybe what what did you say it wasn't even negligence because I, I, I think about this all the time yeah it's like it's always better to assume ignorance than ignorance. malice yeah malice. yeah and it rarely fails but you figure out which ones have malice but super brief big contract we're doing these arrangements i want a more favorable contract that really benefits concertized and the arrangers it doesn't cause much harm to the clients but it would greatly benefit us i mean it has to be framed in a mutual way why would they change up their contract if they're winning and there's just some like unfavorable things in there that is a little gray and just it's just it's it's kind of clear to me it's like oh well they just like 99 percent of all lawyers have spoken to just don't understand the weird particular things about arrangement and sheet music. It's weird. It's not profitable. So like why, if you're a lawyer, why would you dabble in this weird complex thing that like barely pertains to 97% of all music? They're dealing with sync rights and mechanicals and ownerships and PROs and tours for big artists. They're not worried about the little sheet music that makes a dollar on commissions. Um, yeah. but still it's like, they're just things in there. We want a better contract. And so like a lot of the anger is like, oh, well, did they set this up to like deceive us to sign these contracts? Like, no, they just don't know. And so we go into this meeting and like, we're saying some things and I was like, Hey, you know, we begin in a friendly way. It's not in malice. Um, we make it about them. And uh, a big part is we don't, you also just don't lie. I think this is like a huge point. Don't deny that things will benefit you because then it seems like a scam. If you come in here just like, yeah, we want a new contract because it's going to make everything better for you. Um, Like, no, you need to like let them know like, hey, this is better for us for these reasons. There's some also some perks for you. Like you're less legally liable now. You have more protections and it's going to bring the cost down or whatever it may be. And it benefits us. And then I tell them how it benefits us because then they see it like, oh, they're pushing for it for this. It's not out of malice or trying to undercut me. They can do this and they're going to take on more responsibility. But it was just very clear. I couldn't quite get it from the text of an email that in these this situation and many other situations, often they just don't know. When they sent you that contract, they might not have read it all. You know, some lawyer and their team sends it out. They don't know the particulars. They're busy in their own jobs and their own lives to have seen that in clause 11.2. You know, C that it has some unfavorable language. And so you don't come in hot and light them up for trying to trick you or scam you. It's just like, hey, I flag- flagging this. Like, let's talk about this. I, I think we don't, it just doesn't need to be here. Or let's frame it in this way. And then I just say, why? And they're like, yeah, no, that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Tons of these examples. One last thing I want to highlight before we jump to our our next section is um, when you're dealing with influencing other people, right? And this is kind of in the vein of what you were talking about. It's like highlighting the benefits that you have and the benefits they're going to get. Another way to frame it is like 
and this is this is what Carnegie said, the only way on earth to influence other people is to talk about what they want and then show them how to get it. Mm. That's beautiful. Do you want to dig into that? Yeah, I'll, just really quickly, right? It kind of goes into like the principles of like being in, being interested in people, and this this is very much essential social skills networking, being interested in other people, learning about what they want, what they desire, not what they have, but what they want, right? Mm-hmm. And if there's something that you, you can do to give them something that they want. And if you could find a way to where they can help you get what you want, if you can both get what you want by working together, that's when you find a way to collaborate. That's when you find a way to achieve greater things than just the sum, like just your individual efforts. It's the sum of your efforts, which is greater than the units. So I- I'm telling you, like, it's really, really important to just fucking listen to people, y'all. Like it's, it's the cheat code of life just reveals itself when you're genuinely interested in other people, you find out what they want. It's not about what you want. Oftentimes you will get what you want by helping other people get what they want, which is like the hugest hack that I can, I can impart upon you. That's beautiful. And you see this now with who's becoming the CEOs of these companies. I can't remember. Uh, it was just some Twitter thread or something like that. But they were talking about like CEOs in like the 80s, you know, where they were all these builders. And then CEOs in the early 2000s, late 90s, you get your Steve Jobs. They were the marketing people. Mm-hmm. Who are all the CEOs now? And so, so we have this old idea that like, oh, a CEO needs to be a Zuckerberg. You know, they're the visionary. They go out and, and drive. Who are the CEOs now? They're all supply chain people. <laughs> They're all people who like worked on AWS, cloud computing, worked on, you know, the digital version of Walmart, worked on the digital PayPal brand. Mafia. Of, like you get all of these really arguably like bore, boring job, like their job is supply chain and like making things more efficient. Though that's who's becoming the CEOs of these companies. They're not the most sexy on camera. They're not coming out with that vision or just some creative marketing ploy. Tim Cook is a supply chain guy. What is interesting about all of them is that all of these people were team players. None of them were going it alone, going rogue with their own vision. Everyone who's becoming like who are the, you know, in charge of the most powerful companies on the planet made the previous CEOs look great. <laughs> <laughs> well, can I can I actually yeah. like maybe illustrate this a little bit more? It's like okay, so one thing we learn is that like what got you here is not mm-hmm. the same as what is going to get you to the next level. What got you where you are right now is you're going to have to do something different to get to the next level. So like maybe Steve Jobs was essential for getting Apple to the iPhone. Oh yeah, but then how do you make Apple into the biggest company on the planet? Well, maybe it's not doing the same thing that got them like started. Maybe it is like, like you said, the supply chains. Another thing to think about is like countries like Japan has no natural resources. They, they can't even like farm on their land. They have to import most of everything, oil, food. But what Japan is incredible at is systems, developing systems. So, like, there, there are different ways of skinning the cat, but, uh, yeah, I just, I just think that, like, it's super important, like, when it comes down to it, is allocating that which people want to them and finding a way to do that. Because, like, if you're able to get people to discover their wants and needs, they'll follow you to the ends of the earth. Um, this, let's, let's hit this last section. Be a leader. How to change people without giving offense or arousing resentment. There are nine points to this. Number one, begin with praise and honest appreciation. This harkens back to our first section. Number two, call attention to people's mistakes indirectly. Indirectly is the key. Number three, talk about your own mistakes before criticizing other people. You'll see this in comedy when Mm. comedians roast each other. They'll say, I mean... (sighs) Look at me, I'm like the budget, you know, 
<laughs> Grinch. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like they, <laughs> they they shit on themselves as they're shitting on other people. So it makes it a lot easier. Uh, number four, ask questions instead of giving direct orders. Number five, let the other people save face. So don't address them directly. Be like, somebody smells like shit in here. <laughs> <laughs> and then everybody goes, <laughs> let them save face, right? Uh, number six, praise the slightest improvement and praise every improvement. Be hearty in your approbation and lavish in your praise. Uh, number seven, give the other person a fine reputation to live up to. I was talking to Michelle about that last night. Mm. Like sometimes when you're a leader, like let people not want to disappoint you instead of like raise your expectations of them and they'll rise to the occasion, right? Um, use encouragement. Make the fault seem easy to correct. And number nine, make the other person happy about doing the thing you suggest. I like that because this is the detailed section. Yeah. Um, but honestly, like at least for all of us in the stage of the careers we're at, it's like some of the most relevant because these are the things that are v very actionable uh, and that as musicians at this stage, like we have to do in positions where we have employees or group members or whatever family <laughs> like it's all incredibly helpful and so just like looking at this list it's like okay good like yes do that yes do that uh-oh for haven't been doing that uh-oh haven't been doing that if you know a lot about them because you're interested in them you know what they like to do outside of work or outside of the like main point of contact and the reason you interact with them most you're going to be able to do this a lot easier. You're going to be able to help them out. If you know what's going on at home, if you know they're going through some health thing, if you know like, wow, they're not at their best right now because of this, like, let me just remember, or even just draw attention to it. Hey, I know you're super stressed because of blah, blah, blah. I hope, I hope your mom's okay. Will that affect like the timeline? Do I need to account for this? Not like, are you fucking late? I'm going to kill you. <laughs> I'm gonna go kill your mom. Like, <laughs> just, it's like, oh, uh, oh, uh, it's just, bro, bro, it's just a game. Okay, boss. Yeah, 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 you're good. Um, so, uh, I try to do number three a bunch, and the the talk about your own mistakes before criticizing the other person. We've got this big, we've got all these Google sheets or whatever, and like process keeping track of things. Again, uh, supply chain. <laughs> <laughs> where are things in process at work? And there's a lot of moving pieces and stuff will fall through the cracks. So I stress like, hey, let's over communicate. But sometimes I don't update the sheet because I'm in the flow. And what is it? We criticize people for their outcomes or their actions, but we don't criticize ourselves because we understand our full situation. I don't remember the exact quote. There's a much better way mm -hmm. of saying that. But basically we give ourselves the benefit of the doubt. Um, if we, we are speeding, it it's because, oh, God, this is really important that we're late or, oh, I need to get to the hospital. But if someone zooms past us, it's never, oh, they need to get to the hospital or they're late for, like, the kid's graduation. It's like, wow, what an inconsiderate asshole. Uh, we always give ourselves the benefit of the doubt because we know the context. When we're speeding or cutting a line, we don't do the same. Uh, I make sure, I'm like, hey, I'm, I'm going to post more on this. Like, I'm sorry I haven't been keeping up this, sh you know, process sheet this document up to date. I know I'm behind on this. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to improve on that. Could everyone else also mm -hmm. go in and like input what they need to do? We need to do this because we don't want anything to fall through the cracks and get into a tight spot later. Like right there. That's like, that's all it needs to be said. Doesn't need 12 paragraphs about responsibility or like, this is your job. Damn it. You know, <laughs> it's just like, I also need to do this, which is true. It would be helpful if we all do this. Here's why. Period. Hey, Daniel, quick question. So uh, what do you think the value of calling attention to people's mistakes indirectly in maybe a situation uh, like maybe a quartet rehearsal <laughs> Or <laughs> yeah, maybe when I mean, you uh, played that wrong note, uh, not just <laughs> yeah, it's like you fucking suck. 
Yeah. <laughs> no, no, no uh, you know, actually, I, I was going to jump in and add something. Um, but add it. In terms of being a leader, I mean, what you guys just uh, said with all the principles and stuff like that. For the faking fam um, who want to pursue a career in teaching, I mean, all of these principles apply. Mm -hmm. And in reference to what you said about like indirectly making a mistake, I mean, one example that I can think of in my teaching is this idea of when you're teaching someone, you know, giving information as opposed to giving commands, which is basically number, uh, it's a combination of number two and number four, right? Yeah. yeah number yeah. four being ask questions instead of giving direct orders. So, you know, how you word stuff is very, very important. For example, something I learned when I uh, took um, a Suzuki pedagogy course is that don't ever tell a student that whatever they played was bad. Mm -hmm. Tell them mm -hmm. that it could have been better. So whenever some uh, student might play something, I always start off with the good things. And then after that, you know, usually you go to the bad things, right? It's like the good and the bad, but it's not good and bad. It's good. And what could be better, mm. you know? And so that triggers a combination of all the principles. I mean, it triggers um, number eight, use encouragement, you know, uh, make the fault seem easy to correct. You know, it triggers nine in a way, make the other person happy about doing the thing you suggest because bad has a very negative connotation, in my opinion, especially for a young kid. Oh, geez. You know, imagine if you were like, yo, why'd you play that like, like garbage? You know, <laughs> you spit like, out. <laughs> Yeah, like, you know, at an at a age where they're, like, developing, I think it, it, you have to be very particular with how you word things. And even, I mean, even not for a kid, even for, like, a high school student. Because, like, you know, it's, like, moments like that where they will carry that for the rest of their lives. Mm -hmm. And, like, you know, I uh, just want to add um, for the last chunk that we talked about, win people to your way of thinking. For any of you faking fam who um, want to become chamber musicians. Mm -hmm. This is the reason why being a chamber musician is really, really difficult. And so if any of you faking fam want to become a chamber musician, I literally want you to memorize this episode <laughs> word for word. I want you to listen to it. Put in your 10,000 hours. Like you know, and subscribe. And like and subscribe. Yeah, like and subscribe at the same like time. <laughs> no, but seriously, like, I always like to say, like, you know, uh, if you're a chamber musician, you should get a, a degree in music performance and psychology. Yes. Because it's not about, it's not just about playing together and playing in tune. There's a whole nother component to it, which is listening to people, you know, compromise, all of these things that we talked about before. This is beautiful, Daniel. I yeah, like everything. Just rewind. You don't even have to listen to the full episode. Just re-listen to what. Daniel no, you have to. No, the whole. You have to. The but whole, you do have to like oh, and subscribe yeah. and uh, give us five stars. But, but but no, I I think it's important because if you think about it, when you're watching some documentary or you're reading up about some band or some group, very little of it is ever spent talking about making music. They might show some clips in the studio, but. It's not really like, oh, this idea came from this and this and this. You're just watching how they interact. The biggest part of any band's story is when they break up <laughs> or when they got together. Like those are fundamental things. How do they interact? The Beatles, all the drama within the group. Who's dating who? Who hates this? Like that's the stuff that like interests people and like is very critical to the out output. That's the essential things. It's interesting looking at this like now, like having to be in leadership, it is hard to get people to buy into your vision. Like what Drew, Drew said, like if it's kind of such an obvious vision, why would they buy? You know, it's it's the bar's too low. Like it's it's not like something that you really want to like strive towards. And it has to be mutual. They have to want to be a part of that vision. Otherwise, they're not going to do it. They put in the extra time and the extra work on a lot of these things because they believe in the vision. Like fundamentally, 
It's like does helping def- you with yeah. your vision help them get what they want? Bingo. Underline, underscore. Uh, and it can be anything. Sometimes like, okay, you we, we want this raise. We're doing more work. Like it can just be money. It's like, oh, I want more money. <laughs> In order to get more money, this thing needs to be a success. Or like, oh, I want to have my own this, that, and the other. Do I need to do this to get towards that vision? Um, what's really interesting, again, coming from another podcast talking about power, was that instilling fear and yelling at someone doesn't produce positive results ever in like the long on, in the long run ever. You see all of these like because we we idolize a lot of these like coaches that are just screaming at everyone. We forget about so many coaches who are ridiculously successful who never yelled at anyone, you know, treated everyone like adults, like they're all professionals over here. And we get this kind of from the, this person's point being that they were interviewing a bunch of generals, you know, two-star generals, three-star generals, people who've been in the business for years. And they're saying like, I've never m- made a demand or a command ever. I have to ask people. <laughs> and it, it is when you see on TV some police chief, some officer, some agent screaming at someone to do something, he's like, that is TV. It's what we think we should do. It's what CEOs and a lot of people and teachers and admin, everything thinks leadership is commanding. But none of those people are in the armed service. In our actual military, None of that. He's like, I only have to ask people. I have to convince them. I have to get them on my side and like share my vision. Going down the Dale Carnegie principles. And this is the military. Like this is very important <laughs> to get people on your side or with your vision. And he's not yelling or trying to coax people with fear. He's like, it doesn't work. That's not how it's done. It is in TV only. And the, Russia. Yeah, and Russia. <laughs> and, 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 but you can see how well that's going for their military. Not great. Um, exactly. And yeah. then you see it with Zelensky. Like everyone, he's just like loving him, getting universal praise. People are outnumbered, outgunned, and they are fighting for that cause. And they have someone to believe in, and he's not hes not yelling at them. There's some yep. greater cause. And the, just like the, the, the very last thing, um, the biggest employer of like sports psychologists and performance psychologists in the world is the U.S. military. They could be, you know, spending even more money on bombs and all that stuff. But who cares more about, like, you, you wouldn't think, like, you know, our big rough and tough military that we just blow all this money on is spending a bunch of time and money on therapists and psychologists. But absolutely, that's, that's what they're doing because they understand the importance of leadership, of the mind, on how to treat people. They're the ones spending, <laughs> the people who are running around killing people and defending us and all that other fun stuff are going, are having, going to therapy. You have to like yeah. convince people to be able to give up their lives for a greater cause. Like what's, what's a harder ask yeah. than giving up your life. Right. But you know, the vision of having safety and prosperity for the, your loved ones at home, it's a really good vision to share something everybody wants. Right. So I, I think that that makes total sense. And and so when you embark upon your projects, I want you to return to this episode. Yes, we make fun. We're joking about it, about <laughs> kissing ass. But I would say kissing ass is, is more flattery than genuine appreciation, empathy, and love for other people. And love that is so deep that you listen to them you see things from their perspective and you mine through introspective questions, you mine their mind to figure out what they want and you figure out a way to deliver it to them. And I don't think there is an, it, it, there's any nobler a cause than that, than to make other people's lives better, be of service to other people and, and to put them first. And so if you're able to do that, you will not be you will not be wanting for help in achieving your goals and your visions because at the very same time you'll be doing that for other people. That's beautiful. 
I want to wrap this up on a quote from an amazing movie, Everything Everywhere, All at Once. I'm obsessed with this movie. It's incredible. And one of the characters seems really passive, really nice. You know, sees the good in everything. And we often like attribute that to being like naive uh, or weak. But here, here's the exact quote. Um, it's like, when I choose to see the good side of things, I'm not being naive. It is strategic and necessary. It's how I learn to survive through everything. And that moment in that film, I mean, the whole film's awesome. Go see it. Go buy it. Uh, there's just some like earth shattering phrases that it's just like, that's how you can go through and process. The guy is among many others, like the hero of the movie. When we could always turn to darkness that like nothing matters anymore that, you know, we're all going to fail. And like, why Nietzsche. do we put up? Yeah. It, when it's Nietzsche time, what's seen as like passivity, the naivete, just the, the push back against the darkness, so to speak, isn't weakness. That's the strongest thing you can do. That's leadership. That's how you win friends and influence people. <laughs> hmm. How's that for a bow? <laughs> Beautiful. Thank you so much for listening, guys. Like, uh, let us know what you thought in the Discord channel. Um, be sure to uh, follow us on Spotify, subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts, and uh, we'll see you guys uh, very soon. This is, uh, I think this is a wrap for, for season three. Um, we'll be returning uh, shortly, and uh, we're looking forward to more episodes for y'all. Till next time, everybody. One, two, three. Cancun! Yeah. Ah, Cancun. <laughs>